Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. I call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for Tuesday, April 13, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and the offices are closed to the public until further notice in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend these those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meeting Act by being able to listen and or view these those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Jamison, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the meeting? Ms. Pastor? Present. Ms. Rowe? Here. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joes? Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Jamison, would you please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting? Thank you. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. No. no present. Mr. Saras. Present. Dr. Scriven. Present. Ms. Bernhardt? Present. King? Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Mr. McMillian, uh, sorry. Yes, I just joined. This is Molly. Okay. Apologies. So, no problem. Uh, opening remarks. Uh, I would like to welcome the staff, the committee members, other board members, the public. Uh, I'm very excited today that we're going to have Ms. Sherry King uh, to present the FY20 single audit report. Ms. King, you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillian, and thank you for having me today. I'm at your audit committee to report on the Baltimore County Public Schools single audit for fiscal year 2020. Um, just a quick um, kind of explanation as to what the single audit is, if you might not be familiar with it. It is essentially an audit of the school system's federal grant expenditures for the year. Um, any governmental entity that receives in excess of $750,000 of federal expenditures in a given year is required to have the single audit. Um, and Baltimore County Public Schools is, is very blessed to have well in excess of that amount. Um, so this is an audit that we, we do annually for the school system and have done so for quite a number of years. Um, this year was a little unique um, due to COVID and not only due to the pandemic, but the amount of funding that came into the school system this year as a result of the CARES Act um, that was enacted uh, by Congress at the end of March 2020 um, that funneled in some additional money um, that you wouldn't normally receive in a given year um, that was um, subject to the single audit as well. So we are, we are a tad bit late in issuing this report this year due to that money. Um, typically, your single audit is due to the Maryland State Department of Education by December 31st. Um, however, um, school systems in the state of Maryland were granted a three month extension um, through March 31st, 2021 um, in, as, as a response to the COVID funding. Um, and we did um, issue our single audit report um, by that March 31st deadline for submission to the Maryland State Department of Education once again this year. Uh, 
one of the main reasons um, why the audit was delayed was due to what we call the compliance supplement. Um, our single audit is um, performed in accordance with the federal uniform guidance. So the federal guidance kind of dictates um, how the audit is laid out, how we determine our major programs for, for testing, um, and what actually we do test when we, um, when we um, do select a major program. Uh, that is in the way of a compliance supplement that's issued annually. It's a very large document whereby um, the large um, federal grants, it's not 100% of all federal grants, but it has uh, the majority of the federal grants um, are in this compliance supplement. And it basically is our audit guide um, as to what the feds want us to test in relation to the single audit for those programs. Um, due to the timing of the stimulus package at the end of March of 2020 last year, and that compliance supplement in year end, everything was delayed as that um, guidance from the federal government was not received actually until roughly a couple days before Christmas of 2020. Um, so that was the federal government's nice Christmas present to us uh, was these pieces of the compliance supplement we needed related to the new CARES Act grants um, for fiscal year 2020. So. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of an understanding as to why our audit was delayed this year um, as opposed to prior years um, and, and kind of where we kind of are at this point um, in issuance. I'll go ahead and, and kind of just give you a, a brief overview um, of your federal expenditures. For fiscal year 2020, your federal expenditures were around $103 million. Um, that um, resulted in three programs having to be tested as major programs for fiscal year 2020. The first one is Title I, which had a little under $30 million of expenditures. The Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Fund, uh, which is known as ESSER, which is a CARES grant, um, a CARES Act grant um, that was roughly $4.5 million in expenditures. And then coronavirus relief funds was another CARES Act grant that you received that we audited, um, which was roughly $2.1 million of expenditures. Um, this resulted in us testing roughly 35% of that $103 million of federal expenditures that you received and reported on for fiscal year 2020. The federal requirement was a minimum of 20% coverage um, of your federal expenditure. So we did um, exceed that by, by quite a, a good bit of amount. Um, we do issue a separate audit opinion on each of the three uh, major programs that were tested. Um, that's how our audit opinion kind of works for the single audit. Um, and we did have three findings for fiscal year 2020 that I can go, I'll go into more um, information here. The first finding uh, was associated with Title I. This was a significant deficiency in internal control related to the reporting compliance area um, of the program. Uh, the finding um, was related to the financial status reports that are submitted monthly to the Maryland State Department of Education. As part of our testing, we selected three months of the out of the 12 months that um, that required submissions. We reviewed the reporting to the Maryland State Department of Education to make sure it's accurate based on your supporting documentation and make sure somebody reviewed it and approved it prior to submission that you had um, sound internal controls in place over that submission. Um, for two out of the three months that we selected for testing, uh, management could not provide uh, the report um, to us um, as it's in paper copy and it had been misplaced. Um, so therefore, this resulted in a significant deficiency in internal control. Um, and we recommend that um, the board implement or, or revise their policies and procedures to make sure that those financial status reports are maintained um, as they are audit documentation, the necessary supporting documentation um, related to those reports, so they are you know, available for, for audits as, as in any documentation you would have. 
Title I did receive an unmodified audit opinion, which is a clean opinion or a, you know, a, a good opinion um, that you would be looking for um, in respect to the entire program. The next finding uh, was related to finding 2020-02 is related to the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Uh, just a little bit of information on the Coronavirus Relief Fund for your information. This was a CARES Act grant um, that actually um, funneled uh, money down to state and local governments. Um, Maryland, uh, state of Maryland did decide to um, take a portion of, of their Coronavirus Relief Funds and provide it to uh, the school systems in Maryland to supplement um, other funding received. Um, so that's kind of the, the how this money came down to um, Baltimore County Schools. And it was spent on information technology, laptops and, and, and um, devices um, for students. Um, there were three specific criteria related to these funds um, overall. The first was that they had to be necessary expenditures in res as a result of the pandemic. Um, they were not part of your approved budget and that those expenditures occurred after March 1st, 2020 um, and, and the ending date was December 31st, 2021. So um, you couldn't incur expenditures prior to March 1st for this grant. During our testing um, is two compliance areas. The finding relates to its allowable costs and activities as well as period of performance. We noted that there was approximately $200,000 and expenditures charged to this grant that were prior to the grant start date of March 1st. Um, those expenditures ranged roughly from July through November of 2019. Um, therefore, they not only did not meet the criteria um, of occurring um, after March 1st, 2020, but they also did not meet the criteria of, be, of not being budgeted. Um, those expenditures um, that were back in July through November 2019 were budgeted um, in, in, your, in your annual budget. Um, so therefore we had question cost of approximately $200,000 that were charged to the grant that should not have been. Um, as a result of this finding, um, it was considered a material weakness and in internal control and a material non-compliance due to the fact that the question costs were approximately 10% of your total expenditures for the program of $2.1 million. And that resulted in us having to qualify um, our opinion on um, the coronavirus relief program. Uh, and of course, we just recommended that the board would establish procedures to ensure that they're charging um, expenditures to, to this federal grant and any federal grant um, with their, within the period of, of the grant performance um, that's stated in the grant award. Okay, and lastly, um, our third finding is um, related to the ESSER grant. Um, that's the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Grant. Also um, funding that was passed down um, to school systems via the CARES Act um, last March of 2020. Um, this, this grant actually had a lot of um, uh, variety in terms of how you could spend the money and what could be charged for the grant. Um, it really gave the school system a lot of flexibility. Um, and one of those areas where the school system used the money on was, was food service, was the continuance of um, food service, covering those costs when school ended um, in March of 2020. Um, to uh, not only provide uh, meals to, to students to continue that program, but also pay for salaries for um, those food service workers that would not be working due to the schools being closed. Um, the finding related to the ESSER grant specifically was that uh, the board did not have supporting documentation um, for the approval of hours work for nine out of 40 timesheets that we reviewed. Um, that was due to timing, I will say, to be honest with you. Um, due to delay in a single audit, our procedures on ESSER were performed um, in the January timeframe, and that was after your ransomware attack in November. 
And as a result of the ransomware attack, those electronic approvals um, for those timesheets um, could not be accessed for our audit. Um, so that's kind of the, the reasoning um, why we did not have those um, timesheet approvals. Um, so um, this resulted in a significant deficiency in internal control. Um, however, for um, ESSER, uh, we did um, issue an unmodified or a clean audit opinion for that program. Um, so those are the three findings that we have. I'd be glad to take any questions related to our audit or the findings that were discussed. Um, I will provide just a little bit of a flavor um, that we know of today for the fiscal year 2021 audit based on our findings um, for the 2020 audit. Um, as a result of the qualified opinion in the material weakness associated with the coronavirus relief funds, that program will have to be tested once again in fiscal year 2021. So we do know that will be up for testing once again. Uh, in addition, the school system will um, be considered a other than low risk auditee for the entire single audit purpose. And therefore um, for 2021, our audit coverage will go from that minimum I talked about, we needed 20% this year will actually be increased to 40%. So we'll have to test um, at least 40% of the federal expenditures um, in relation to the 2021 single audit. So those are just some of the things that we know today um, that will be, um, you know, will affect um, next year's single audit for the federal expenditures. And everything else at this point, we're not quite sure of um, in terms of what will be tested in 2021 it will depend on guidance um, received from the federal government, which we do not expect to, to get much before the summertime of 2021. Oh, thank you. I, I noticed Mr. Kuhn had, uh, has a comment. Mr. Kuhn, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. McMillian. Hi. Hi, Ms. King. How are you? Good, good. good it's good to see you. Um, I just have a few questions just so I fully understand the scope, right? So this was, this single audit clearly is just focused on 2020, right? Correct. Our audit period was July 1st, 19 through June 30, 2020. All right. So what I'm trying to understand is the timing of the CARES Act funding and the amount for FY 2020. Because I see I, I, I've looked at your report and I see an amount of like four million dollars or something like that in there associated with the CARES Act. And I'm trying to figure out because um, I know that the CARES Act one and then ESSER uh, and then CARES Act two are all big piles of money in essence. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand the years that we're allowed to spend that money because my understanding is that those funds become available like June 26th um, uh, of 2020. And I'm trying to understand, you know, how how we allocated money um, and, and how we allocate money for 21 also, because I know you'll be looking at that, I guess, this coming year, uh, so that I fully understand basically the amount of money you're looking at a year. Because mm -hmm. so, it's tough to follow, to be honest with you. It is, and, and the reason for that is usually grant awards span over multiple years, um, and it can be multiple fiscal years. Um, and the other thing that kind of adds some complexity too is that the federal fiscal year is very different than what your local fiscal year is as well. So that kind of adds a nuance to um, when you're looking at grant awards. Um, so due to the timing, this, these these CARES Act grants, the, the two that you received related to the ESSER and the CRF, um, combined were roughly $6.6 .6 million of expenditures. That was just for the period March 1st through June 30, 2020. So you only had a couple months in fiscal year 2020 that were capturing, obviously, um, even though those grant awards extend past June 30, 2020. So for example, the coronavirus relief one is a good example. Um, you can spend that money through December 31st, 2021. Um, so there's still, well, I think the grant award, and, and I'm sure Mr. Saris can add a little bit more information on detail than I can at this point. I believe our coronavirus relief funds was roughly $12 million in a grant award, 
but she only um, spent 2.1 million um, in that 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 short window of, of March through June 2020. The remaining would be spent um, after July 1st of 2020, um, if that helps you. Um, the same with the ESSER grant as well. Um, those would be spent after June um, 30, 2020. Um, would be subject to next year's audit and subsequent audits after that, because I know you have several years to spend the ESSER grants. Um, if that kind of helps you. So you really, out of the $103 million of federal expenditures for 2020, you had a very small portion of roughly $6.6 .6 million that was related to the CARES Act um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was, it was a relatively a very small portion that were as under audit this year uh, we're mentioning right now. And really the main reason that this was a um, a finding that you consider, I forget the term you used for it, um, a material weakness was because mm -hmm. of the, it was it was 10% or more of, of the amount. Is that accurate? I'm trying to understand yeah. that. Yes, it was. So the question costs were roughly $202,000 um, out of expenditures for fiscal year 2020 of 2.1 million. So that's roughly 10%, give or take. Um, so that we do consider that to be material to the program. Now, if you were, that that does not mean, how do I don't want to say this? That's not the whole grant award. You guys did receive significantly more funding than $2.1 million, but that was all that was spent during the audit year that we were looking at. And so that was my total population to go on, if that makes sense for this audit. It does. Thank you. I was, I was mm -hmm. trying to understand because it's, 20, you know, we're in April 2021 right now. Right. We're talking about a year ago. And then there's been an incredible amount of spending since then. And you're not going to be looking at that, or maybe you already have started looking at that, but that's not part of what we're talking about at all. No, it's not. And we have not looked at that yet. So we just wrapped up this audit and we'll be starting um, our fiscal year 2021 um, work for both the financial statement, the CAFR, and the single audit roughly, you know, around the June timeframe. Um, but we won't be reporting on that for quite a while, to be honest with you. Thank you. Perhaps and and just one last question. When you talk FY um, in, in your reports, mm -hmm. are you talking about our fiscal year or are you talking about the federal fiscal year? BCPS's fiscal year, which is July 1st through June 30. Okay, I just... I want to make sure I'm keeping it straight. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Jones has a question, please. Um, actually, Ms. Mr. McMillian, Mr. Kuhn asked a couple of my questions, and Ms. King, thank you for your presentation. She answered some of my questions when she was explaining, so thank you. Uh, Ms. Pastor, any questions? Ms. Rowe? Yes, I have a question. So what are the implications of these findings on um, eligibility for continuation of the federal programs? Because I understand we have to be compliant with the guidelines and the findings seem to indicate that in some cases we weren't. So what what's the procedure from here going forward to correct these findings? So I'll, I'll maybe address the first part of it in terms of what the implement, implement excuse me, implicate, I have trouble saying that word. <laughs> um, but, but this audit goes to the Maryland State Department of Education. They are your funding source for the majority of your federal grants. They're passed through the State Department of Education. So that would be up to them to evaluate the findings and, and, and go from there. So I, I can't really um, say one way or another as to far as what are the implications uh, of the audit in terms of, of future funding or this funding, to be honest with you. Um, I did kind of provide kind of where we will sit next year for the single audit in terms of our audit, um, but your findings do go to the Maryland State Department of Education um, for them to review, as well as the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Treasury um, were the fund, the federal funding sources as well. So um, that would be up to them to review and 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 and, and look at. Um, in terms of corrective action, I think that would be more a, a question for Dr. Mr. Sayers, to be honest with you, 
in terms of management. Yeah, this is George Saracen. I think this is a good point for me to add some comments that in the past we have had prior findings. Um, we had uh, findings in 2011, uh, or excuse me, 2010 in amount of $91,000. We had a finding in 2017 of $95,000 and none of these have ever affected our eligibility for federal grants. Mr. George, you okay? Yeah, I just, I don't have, I'm not speaking. Is there something else? <laughs> okay. Oh. Is there any follow-up? No, that answers my question. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Barr has a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. King. I do have a couple of questions, comments. First mm -hmm. of all, I wanted to be sure that um, I understood correctly that the CFA um, was fairly stated. Is that accurate? Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Could you explain in just, um, layman's terms what that means? In terms of the CFA being fairly stated? Yes. Um, sure. So so we do give uh, in relation to opinion as well. Thank you for, for bringing that up. I, I did um, forget to mention that. Um, we do um, obviously, the, the federal expenditures are basically what we consider a subset of your comprehensive annual financial report that was issued back in September of 2020. Um, it's basically just a subset of the expenditures that are reported in that whole document. It's not all expenditures, it's a federal portion of it. So we do um, review the expenditures and compare it to your financial records um, to make sure that they are in agreement in relation to the um, the CAFR opinion that we provided back in September, and we didn't have any issues in terms of uh, those expenditures not not matching up or aligning, so to speak. But but this this report, these federal expenditures of 103 million dollars are a subset of the total expenditures that are reported um, for the school system as a whole in the comprehensive annual financial report. Okay, thank you. And sure. then with respect to um, being a low risk auditee, the potential yeah. is that that would only happen perhaps for this upcoming year that we could reverse things and satisfy um, the findings in, in this report that we would then move back to a low risk auditee. Is that accurate? So um, when you have a material weakness, um, such as the case for the finding for the coronavirus relief funds, um, it actually takes two years to funnel that out, so to speak. And what I mean by is you will be an other than low risk auditee for fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22, barring that there are no additional material weaknesses in either one of those audits. In fiscal year 23, you could possibly go back down to a low risk auditee. It takes two years for that, that, that classification to be downgraded, barring everything's resolved, quote unquote, so to speak, and we don't have any um, findings in, in, in those next two years worth of audits that are at the material level. Okay, thank you. And to, to get the forty percent coverage, um, are you going? Do you anticipate type A as well as type B program coverage, or you, it's just too soon to say? I think it's too soon to say. Um, we always test um, a type A program. You have um, the school system has three large type A programs: Title One, which we tested this year, in addition to special education and child nutrition cluster. And those are rotated every year per the federal guidance. Guidance they have to be tested. Each program has to be tested in at least one of three years. Um, so one of those programs most likely will get us close to that 40 percent, not probably over the 40 percent. Um, at that point, we would take a look and see what else um, you have that might rise to a Type A. And I would anticipate that the federal funding you're getting for the um, coronavirus um, and the the subsequent stimulus um, packages that came after the CARES Act 
um, could possibly um, be subject to audit depending on the threshold of expenditures and if they realized um, or get to a type A in terms of, of the threshold. So at this point, I think it's too early for us to tell, but I would imagine we'll still be continuing to test a lot of the, the COVID-19 money in the next couple of years. Um, as much as I know you guys have been granted and awarded, I, I my gut's telling me that we'll be looking at that as well in some way, shape or form. I just don't know how yet. Okay, thank you. And with re relation to finding uh, <laughs> number three, is was T D required for that? Um, and if so, why or why not? And if and if it was required, was it semi annual certification or or par certification? So Will someone um, please mute somebody. We're getting some background noise here, please. Thank you. Uh, so to answer that question, so um, time and effort did not was not required as part of the ESSER grant. Um, time and effort is usually uh, 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 is a way of reporting payroll costs, um, particularly for salaried individuals that might not have, uh, might not be completing a timesheet each day on exactly what they're working on. Um, usually salaried folks could be working on a variety of things and if they're working on grant programs um, a time and effort certification is required to memorialize um, what they how they spent their time what the percentage of time was spent on grant a versus grant b versus maybe general fund type exp, um, time um, esser um, the payroll that was charged to esser was for food service folks um, as I said, many of those folks actually were not working during um, the time um, due to the school closures, but we're still getting paid under BCPS policy um, that is allowable for the federal grant. And we did um, test to the, the, the BCPS policy to make sure they were being paid in accordance with the policy. Um, but you also did have some food service workers that were working um, during that last quarter of the year um, that we reviewed that would had actual timesheets that would have showed um, the hours that were worked and that they were food service related employees that would have been eligible for the grant. So therefore, we didn't have to rely on time and effort certifications for this program. Thank you. And Mr. McMillian, just one final question, if, right. if you may. Um, what would cause you to qualify? One here, qualify Ten, your hello. Plan? Ms. Bar or Ms. Uh, Pastor? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I've been trying to get in for the longest time. I don't know what I'm doing here. So first, let me apologize if the answer to my question has already um, been given. And if it has, I can get the answer from either you, Mr. Million, or Ms. Ms. Barr. My question goes back to what I think was the second finding, the one where we were out of compliance because of the date it had to be um, after March 1st, and it was prior to that. Um, and I believe you said something to the effect that uh, in terms of the budget that we had already um, approved and it wasn't in compliance with that. So I'm wondering what happened to the amount of money that uh, we took out of the CARES Act or from the CARES Act um, that should have come out of our own budget. What happens with that in terms of is, is there replacement? What happens or does nothing? I heard Mr. Ferris say that there's no real penalty in terms of us not getting federal money. But is there anything that has to happen from the board perspective in terms of that money? Um, so, one of the aspects of the uh, the CARES Act um, in terms of the, the coronavirus relief funds, I'll, I'll speak specifically to that program um, since that's where the finding was and this question cost were. Um, the U.S. Treasury um, does have an Office of Inspector General that has been charged with um auditing this money um, and that has been a mandate that was in the cares act that actually um, was a funded mandate sometimes 
um, Congress will put a mandate in that things have to be audited um, or reviewed, but they don't provide the funding for it. Um, there was actually funding in the CARES Act for the U.S. Department of Treasury Office of Inspector General to, um, to review as necessary um, how these funds were spent. So there, I mean, there is a possibility, um, and, and they did say that they would recoup money if necessary, if it was not spent appropriately. Um, will that happen? I cannot say. Um, is there a dollar threshold that they would go on? I cannot say. Um, it, it's, it's very much open to the Office of Inspector General for that, um, for that to determine that. Um, and that would probably be in conjunction with the Maryland State Department of Education since that's where the money was passed through to um, the Board of Ed. So Ms. Pasture, this is George Saris. I just want to point out on page 13, uh, third paragraph down, the board has removed those costs from the grant and uh, we will replace them with other allowable costs that uh, comply with the award period uh, the timing of the award period and the other requirements of the grant. So uh, we believe we've addressed that matter sufficiently. Occasionally. Thank you. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Occasionally we are asked uh, in, in sometimes an MSDE audit, we might be asked to repay small amounts of money, but that's not expected and, and thank you okay miss uh, we have a couple other questions miss let's go back to miss Barr. she had an additional question if i'm not mistaken sure uh, thank you mr mcmillian um what i wanted to okay thank you again i'm sorry I'm, I'm delayed here but thank you for um the answers from both of you and thank you Ms. Barr? Yes. So, uh, Ms. King, if you could explain why uh, the one finding received a qualified opinion and the other two do not, just to explain that difference and how or why that determination was made. Sure. So, um, finding uh, two related to question cost of the program, um, the other two findings, we did not have question cost. Those findings were uh, more of a internal control nature and a documentation um, nature. So we did not have question costs associated with either one of those findings. Um, the, the coronavirus relief finding with the $200,000 in question cost um, as deemed material then did qualify that program. That was the differentiation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Jones has a, uh, another question. No, I don't. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. I'm sorry. And Mr. Kuhn has a question. All right, thanks. Um, on page 18, um, and it's the corrective action plan mm -hmm. uh, part of the document, I'm looking at the 2020-002 explanation, and maybe this is Mrs. a question for Mr. Saris, uh, since I'm guessing you probably wrote this. Um, is this, we're talking about the corona, you know, uh, finding of zero, zero 002, but it's, it's talking about action in response to finding. And I, I don't think it, it's accurate because it talks about uh, pursuant to November 24 ransomware attack, the board has taken steps to strengthen cybersecurity. Is is this out of order or something? Shouldn't it be like the other finding that that they couldn't find the timesheets for? Because this one we're just talking about accounting for the spending on tablets and and stuff, right? So, Mr. Kuhn, I do believe you're correct. I believe the corrective action um, for finding O2 and O3 are flipped. Okay, that just seemed it it seemed that way. I just wanted yes. to. You know, yeah, you are right. I apologize for that. Yes, they did somehow get flipped. Okay, so I'm not I'm not making things up. All right, thanks. <laughs> no, sorry about that. Yes, that is. No, you that's are, you are right. fine. Thank you for pointing that out. I just wanted to make sense. That's all. All right. Well, um, 
I look forward to the work you're going to do uh, in the upcoming audit, and uh, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. King, I have a couple questions, and, and I'm, I'll lay this out. I'm a complete novice when it comes to this, you know, these topics, and I, I'm just trying to learn this the, the best I can in a short period of time. Sure. I'm curious, who actually pays your firm? Is it the state of Maryland? No, Baltimore County School System does. Uh, we're contracted okay. with the school system. Okay, so we pay you. Now, yes, uh, okay. Now, I just want to understand, you said the minimum, if I'm not mistaken, is you, the minimum number of expenditures you are required to look at is 20%. Right. Okay, and you guys look at 35%. Correct. Okay, and as a result of these findings, now, next year, you're going to look at 40%. Correct. Okay, good. Now, I'm, I'm interested in the, the Title I monies. Okay. Uh, can we go back to that screen? Because it, it, if I'm not mistaken, you looked at two out of the three months you looked at. Mm -hmm. Mr. Corns, can we go back to the screen where it talks about Title I? It's finding 2020-001 on page 11 um, of the report page, I think 13 of the PDF. So the Title I monies is actually $30 million that you looked at, correct? Correct. Uh, so that's a big chunk of money. And you looked at where, it, so it says, the, let's say it's moving around on me. The board does not have supporting documentation noting approval of hours worked for nine out of the 40 timesheets reviewed. So hold on, that's the wrong finding. That's, I'm that's sorry. The, it should be finding 001. There you go. Okay. So the board was unable to provide support to show the FSR, the financial status report submission, was completed for two out of the three months selected for testing. Now, in the Title I monies, you looked at that for an entire year, correct? Uh, we do. So, so our population was the entire year, but we do sample. Okay. So, so we didn't look at all. We won't look at all twelve months that were required to be submitted. We sampled. Our sampling um, took us down to three months that we had to review, and two out of the three months is where we had quote unquote, the finding of them not being able to provide the supporting documentation. OK, and when I when I meant you looked at it for the year, it was because those other care grants, they all didn't kick into March. So you looked at them from March to the end of the year, but then mm -hmm. Title One monies was for the entire fiscal year, correct? Correct, correct. OK, mm -hmm. now I'm curious. So you looked at three months, two months, there were issues. Is, is that something that our internal audit committee needs to look at is those other nine months to see if there's a, a, a trend or a theme or, or something here. So, um, and I can let Mr. Sayers kind of maybe speak a little bit more to um, this particular finding. Um, so, to add a little bit of context, this was a documentation finding. Um, we do know that in order for the school system to receive um, reimbursement for those expenditures from MSDE to get actually paid back or reimbursed, you have to submit those um, financial status reports to the state. So we're not questioning whether or not they were submitted um, to the state. It's just that you, that you, as a part of your internal control system, you need to maintain the documentation so they can be subject to audit. Um, our, my understanding, as Mr. Sarris can, can maybe elaborate, was that right when um, I believe right roughly around the time schools closed, um, there was some remodeling done in the office and therefore um, some of space um, within the finance department had to be cleared out for that remodel and those hard doc copy documents that were missing uh, are a result of the shifting of the of the uh, the hard copies from one location to the next and they got inadvertently lost. Um, so um, we have audited Title I before. We have audited the FSR reports um, for other grants, including Title I in the past and have not had that finding. Um, so um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> this is Mr. Saris. I'd just like to add that MSDE has not questioned those months they have reimbursed us and uh, the backups to the lost hard copies 
were on the the network drive that was lost during the ransomware. So uh, what we have done now is uh, we've created a triplicate system. We've, we've purchased external hard drives for all the users in financial reporting. So we have paper copies. We have a system back copy uh, on our cloud-based uh, servers and we have an external hard drive copy. So we're hoping that we have accounted for future circumstances that will avoid this uh, concern. Okay, and Mr. George, I just have, so are you saying that on those other, so so Ms. King's group looked at three months. If, if we, just, just saying, if we were to want to look at those other nine months, is it the fact they're not there? Uh, I well, I believe that we will find them, but I will be happy to check that and provide them to internal audit or or to this committee uh, if if that is of interest. I don't know whether just, Ms. King looked beyond those two months or not. I was just curious when when you described the new process and the fact that you've got a hard copy involved, and that's you know a, a triplicate kind of process involved. I was just curious about that hard copy. Now, I want to go back and have one more question for Ms. Kang, and then Mr. Sure. George can probably answer that for us. Ms. Kang, do you do you expect management's answer to your audit to come back to your company? Um, so we did. So the, the responses from management are in your report. They're okay. part of the views of responsible officials section of each finding. Um, and we will follow up on those um, on all three findings next year just to make sure that they um, that management has cor provided corrective action and actually, um, you know, is, is no longer a finding, so to speak. So we will be following up on all three of these findings next year in our audit. OK, great. So, so Mr. George, I just want to understand the timeline. So you received this on April 1st and then you went ahead and you you added your your management's comments to the report. Yeah, I think I pro my comments were probably dated March 31st mm -hmm. and okay. then the report came out to include them the next day. OK, OK, great. Uh, committee members, any more questions at board members? Any questions? Doesn't appear to be any more questions, Miss King. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know I really appreciate it, and I, I know these other board members do too. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears and look real quickly for my, uh, for my script. And here I've got it up. Uh, okay, real quickly. Our second item is investigative, uh, let me see, investigative unit statistics. And for that, I call on Mr. Fletcher. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillian. Uh, Mr. Corns, if you would, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I, I know we are a little tight on time, so I will briefly go through this. Uh, but for the, much of, for the month of March, uh, we did receive four new cases. Uh, you'll see them there in our top graph. Uh, we had a misuse of resource uh, allegation come through a payroll fraud allegation as well as a theft and a management issue uh, allegation come through. So with those four cases uh, that brings us to a total of 58 for the fiscal year and again at this point at the end of March we are uh, three quarters of the way through our fiscal year uh, and you'll see in our final chart here on page one um, as we scroll through the, the months of February and March uh, are a little bit lower, as you can see on that purple trend line, uh, a little bit lower than the previous fiscal years. So it's, uh, as we've discussed prior, it's, it's been relatively low all year, um, all fiscal year, uh, with the exception really of January, uh, kind of where we, we got back into the mix. Uh, but February and March uh, have been lighter months. As we go into page two, again, talking about the same four cases that came in uh, in the month of March, 
Uh, now we're looking at how we've categorized them in terms of fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, so of the four that came in, two of them are considered fraud. Uh, one was considered abuse, and then the other is actually uh, considered non-fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, and so for the fiscal year, for the 58 cases that are received, uh, you can see in these second and third charts where we are. Um, so about 33% of the cases that we've received so far this year have been fraud. 7% have been waste. 17% have been abuse, and then 43% uh, are considered non-fraud, waste, or abuse. Now, as you compare those over the previous uh, fiscal years, relatively in line, do see a little bit of a spike in the fraud um, and a little bit of a dip in the abuse, uh, but for the most part, everything is relatively consistent. Uh, then as we go on to our third page, now we're going to take a look at the uh, cases that were closed during the month of March. And so in March, we did close 14 cases. Uh, and as you can see in our first graph here, uh, five of them were unsubstantiated and nine were inconclusive. Uh, and so keep in mind when it's unsubstantiated, that means that that uh, we were able to determine without a doubt um, that whatever information came through it was just not actually correct. Um, inconclusive means we cannot determine one way or another whether it is, um, whether it could be substantiated or unsubstantiated. Um, and so that is the differentiation in there. Uh, for the fiscal year, again, three quarters of the way through, uh, we have closed 55 cases. Uh, and then you can see the breakdown there uh, in chart two. And as we look into chart three, you can see, so about 13% of, of the uh, 55 were substantiated. 2% uh, were partially substantiated, 24 were unsubstantiated, 24%, 18% were inconclusive, and then 44% of those were um, management issues or, or not investigated. Uh, and again, when you look at the year-over-year -year analysis for the last three fiscal years, you can see we're relatively in line, uh, no major uh, bumps or anything that would um, uh, cause us to, to uh, question any outliers. And that was the month of March for our investigative unit. Any questions, committee members or board members? I have one, Mr. Chair. Ms. Rowe, please. Can you um, expound on the payroll fraud one and what that was about? Um, I do not believe we would want to discuss that in open session. Ms. Barr, is that correct? Yes, that, that's correct. Um, additionally, we're getting ready, uh, Ms. Rowe, to issue our um, Q2 and Q3 investigative reports, <coughs> excuse me, to the board. So that, well, that would not be included in, in Q3, Q2 or Q3, but possibly in our Q, Q4 release of our reports. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions? Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much for your report. Yes, sir. Our, thank you. Our third item is the FY21 quarter three report. Ms. Barr, do we have enough time or would you like me to motion to send that straight to the board? Uh, I can go through it very quickly if you if if it's OK with you, Mr. McMillian. I think we have a, a little bit of time left. Yes, please. OK, thank you. So on, on page one of the report, Mr. Corns, we have a summary of our plan hours. And as of March 31, 10,635 resource hours were used to complete our various work plan activities. And approximately 70% of those hours were used to complete direct audit activities. As I mentioned during our um, Q2 update, more hours have been redirected this year to unplanned activities. Consequently, in this quarter, we continued with ransomware recovery and compiled and provided information to the Baltimore County Efficiency Study Group. Additionally, our office began preliminary tasks related to an entity-wide risk assessment. The total number of indirect work plan hours as of March 31 was about 300, three, I'm sorry, 3,369 or approximately 30%. Our investigation information is included on pages two through four. On page two, we see where our 55 cases were closed as of March 31. 
And of those 55 cases, 44% were classified as management referrals. 24% of the cases that came in were reported as management issues. 20% were reported as conflict of interest. 18% related to misuse of company property. 11% to employee behavior and 9% to theft. On page three, we'll see that um, 35% of the 55 cases were fraud related. 5% were just, only 5% were related to waste. 29% were abuse related and approximately 31% would not be classified or could not be classified as either fraud, waste or abuse. On page four, where we talk about our level of substantiation, 44% of our cases had no level of substantiation because they were management issues or were not investigated. Of the cases that were investigated, 24% were unsubstantiated, 18% were inconclusive, 13% were substantiated, and 2% were partially substantiated. And I want to point out on that chart, unfortunately, it was so small, it's, it's that gray, the partial substantiation, that should actually have a number one there. So, um, but I guess it was so tiny, it, it was not reflected on the actual chart itself, but I wanted to point that out to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Corns. And then the audit services um, results, uh, they are included on page five of this summary report. And as of March 31, we've completed 111 risk-based audit activities at 88 schools and 23 offices. And these audit activities included uh, school activity fund audits, procurement card audits, follow-ups, and reviews of the board and super, superintendent expenditures. And we continue to monitor um, the progress of management's corrective action plans related to the UHY and OLA audits. So this is just a summary of information um, that we have provided to the audit committee throughout this year. And pages six through eight of this report actually um, summarize the audit committee activity and uh, that had been previously reported at our audit committee meetings. So you can see on those uh, pages six through eight, there's a summary at the end there. That concludes my uh, Q3 report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Doesn't appear to be any questions, Ms. Barr. Thank you very much. Uh, for your report. Next is unfinished business. Our first item is the OLA monitoring update, and for that I call on Ms. Barr. Yes, thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, we recently received information from management related to their responses uh, for the OLA audit, and I am proposing that uh, because of the ransomware attack, they have to defer or delay um, some of their action plans to a um, date into fiscal year 22. So I am going to um, do the monitoring, continue to monitor and keep receiving status updates from management. But until we are able to actually provide something substantial in a report to the audit committee, I am recommending that this agenda item be removed until that time. Thank you. Any questions? Ms. Barr, I move that this item be removed from the agenda until you're ready to add it back. Is that reasonable? Yes, thank you. I'll Can I have second, a second that. for that motion, please. Second, Ms. Um, Mr. McMillian, Molly. OK, and to, I didn't write my motion in chat, uh, but I moved. That this item, the OLA monitoring update. Be removed from the agenda until Miss Barr recommends that it returns to the agenda. Uh, any discussion on this motion? Uh, Mr. McMillian, I would like to know from Miss Barr when she again, when she expects that it will be added back. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, we are continuing to work with management on specific responses. And as we have done with the UHY audit, 
um, and we presented in in chunks, if you will, um, related to different objectives. So we have received some responses and I'd like to have the opportunity to review and, and assess that information, but I'm projecting probably we're at least three months out. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions? Discussion? Ms. Jameson, will you take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Pester? Ms. Rowe? Abstain. Ms. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Pester? Okay, we have two in favor, one abstain, and one did not vote. So if uh, my interpretation of that is it remains on the agenda, correct? I'm pretty sure that's correct. OK, we'll move on to there's no new business that I'm aware of. Uh, our next meeting, the announcements, the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, May 11th. Mr. McMillian, did anybody hear me say that I voted in favor? No, ma'am. We didn't hear that. <laughs> OK, I voted yes. Ms. Jamison, okay. you OK in then case, with that? In that case, we have three in favor and one abstain. So three out of the four. So it carries. Okay. Somebody please Thank mute, you. mute the speaker. So if we have three. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm OK, it, it's, all, it's all OK, Ms. Pastor. So if we have three votes, then that means the item will be taken off the agenda until Ms. Barr recommends it, correct? Correct, thank you. OK, now we go on to uh, there was no new business announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, May 11th, 2021 at 430. Is there any further business? Mr. McLean, I, I have a question. Yes, please. Ms. Rowe. Um, there are, I think, three or four items that have moved out of committee to the general board, and I wondered if you had a timeline as to when those will be on the board agenda. Well, Ms. Bar or Ms. Rowe, that's what I was going to say. I've asked repeatedly for the two charters and the quarterly report to be added. I have not had any communication back uh, in weeks. So I'm going to attempt that again. Uh, I think that Ms. Barr has had a communication about the quarterly report on the April 20 at the April 20th meeting. Ms. Barr, do you have confirmation that that's going to be uh, discussed? Uh, Mr. McMillian, I have confirmation that the audit committee charter, the internal audit charter, and an overview of the services that our office provides is what is to be discussed on the April 20th board meeting. Okay, great. No, I haven't okay. received that, but great if you've got that because you're going to be the one discussing these different topics, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, and what about the recommendation for um, FDS and ethics training that the committee passed on 316? Um, I've actually received a notice from BCPS that I have to take the training. It's an 85 minute um, training through organizational effectiveness. So I've received notification to take the training. Has that so there is training available? I, I received a notice to take the training. OK, would you like me to follow through Ms. Rowe to determine if that um, same opportunity was provided to board members? Yes, I mean, I believe the recommendation was for it to be provided to the entire school system. I will follow through on that and get back to the committee with respect to uh, who the invitations were sent out to. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rowe, did you ask about two different recommendations or was it one recommendation? It was financial disclosure um, forms and ethics training. OK. OK, so good. So Ms. Barr is going to follow up on that. Thank you very much. Any additional 
information that people would like to share. That being said, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved, Ro. May I have a second? Second, Molly. Ms. Jameson, can I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? I'll come back. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Ms. Pasteur? Okay. I have hers did not vote three in favor. Okay, great. So if I'm not mistaken, that ends the meeting. Yes. Uh, meeting is, excuse me? <laughs> I said yes. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Pasteur. <laughs> Okay, so Ms. Pastor has <laughs> confirmed that she wants to vote for the meeting to be adjourned. Uh, thank you very much. We finished this. It's 539 and I'm extremely happy with the quickness of these meetings. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody live as soon as possible. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye.